Hey guys, how are you? Good to see you again. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son of 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 Spirit. We adore you, Father. We adore you, Son of God, Lord Jesus. We adore you, Holy Spirit. Father, I first ask that you forgive us for our imperfections, our failures, our sins, Father. To our shame, we sin daily. But, Father, please forgive us. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, your Son. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, fill us with power from your Spirit to overcome our flesh, destroy the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, and the boastful pride of life, and save us, Father. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus to walk more in union with the Holy Spirit and to war against the flesh and crucify it, Father. Please, Bobby. Please, Lord Jesus, wash us in your blood. Please, Holy Spirit, sanctify us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you fill us with your Spirit, Fill us with your love. Fill us with your joy. Fill us with your presence. And Father, fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life. <clears throat> Clear up my throat. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Bobby. Avinu, Abba, Father. For the glory of Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus Christ increase in us. May we decrease and speak life to my, my body. The health I need from your spirit to glorify Jesus Christ until the Lord takes me home or until he returns, Father. And Father, bless everyone here. In Jesus' name, bless them, illuminate them with wisdom and knowledge and understanding from your spirit. And Father, please guide me to plunge the depth of scriptures, to see the beauty of scriptures, to unpack the meat of scriptures and save me from error, save me from stammering, from misinterpretation and confusion, Father. And save us from attacks of Satan, Father. Save us from even Christians, who in their gullibility may be used of the devil to cause us to stumble and help me not to be a stumbling block. And Father, in Jesus' name, constrain me. Grant me the perfect power that comes from your spirit to exercise perfect self-control. And I pray that for everyone, Father. Bless them all. That we won't cause each other to stumble, but we'll love each other in Jesus' name. That is, that's my struggle, Father. Lord, help me not to fail you in that area, but to honor you, Father. To honor Jesus, honor Holy Spirit, to be patient with my brothers and sisters as you are patient with me. And again, Father, bless everyone here in all the all the ways and areas that they need your blessing. If they are sick, Father, heal them by the stripes of Jesus Christ. If they're lonely, fill them with your joy and your love and your peace. If they have loved ones who are not saved, save them for the glory of Jesus Christ. If they have loved ones who are ill or sick, Father, then Heal them by the wounds of Jesus, by the stripes of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I ask for my daughters that you flood them in your love and preserve them and seal them and bring them to me sooner than later. And for their sake, deliver me from all my calamities of the devil. And give us the power to remain faithful, to love you, to live for you, to proclaim your word without shame, without fear, without compromise, boldly, lovingly, filled with your spirit to do so. Even if that means that we are persecuted in prison, even put to death. You are worthy. Do not allow us to betray you or deny you or blaspheme your name, but to love you more than this life. You are our life, Father. Lord Jesus, you are our life. Holy Spirit, you are our life. And Holy Spirit, fill me with life now. Fill us with your life, Holy Spirit, to glorify Jesus Christ and save us from attacks of Satan. We ask this in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit, Yahovah, Rapha, Yahovah, Rapha, Yahovah, Rapha, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Welcome, guys. Good to see you. Sadly, I'm a little later than normal. I was supposed to start around 4 p.m. No, what is it? Yeah. 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but now it's 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I go live with Hater Wood. There he goes again. There goes Hater Wood, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going live on Hater Wood's channel, Act 17 Apologetics. We're going to be taking all comers, all challengers, to prove that Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible. The good thing about the stream, at least I'll give my, my throat a chance to rest because David is going to be speaking for 90% of the time. He only has guests to make them look good. 
because with an ugly mug like that, no one will come and listen. So he brings on good-looking apologists like me, a handsome and a Syrian beast, so people can focus on my good looks while he keeps ranting and ranting and ranting and eats up 90% of the time and gives his guests maybe 5% of the time to speak. So God willing, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to go live. So hopefully the Lord Jesus will bless this session and the regulars will show up and I pray more people come. So hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Unfortunately, I didn't know this was going to happen. I don't like to do this. I don't like to live stream when other brothers and sisters in Christ are live streaming. So there is a live stream going on right now. And I didn't know. I would have delayed it for later, but that's okay. The Lord Jesus will, will be done. His will be done. Those who want to hear about Scripture will come here. Those who want to hear about refuting Islam can go there. Yep, DCCI. Yep. Hatun Tash, uh, our precious sister. One thing she didn't realize, I was just watching a few minutes of it. She had put on the screen some of these slides. And I guess she wasn't aware that you could still see her camera. And I saw something that really you need to pray for this sister. Shemunian has jealous of you, Sam. Shemunian has jealous of you? That's curious, because I'm Shemunian. Anyway, I don't know why would Shemunian be jealous of me when I'm I am Shemunian. One thing I did see, folks, and you need to pray for your sister. Honestly, pray for her. We need more sisters like her, more female warriors of Jesus Christ. We don't have many, we need more. But one thing she was she didn't she wasn't aware. She thought it was hidden because she had put the slides, but you could see from the camera. I saw her go for her oxygen tank. You know, she, I saw her put on her oxygen mask to get oxygen from her oxygen tank. So our sister is not completely healthy. Pray in Jesus almighty name. He grants her perfect health and full recovery and keeps her alive for many more years. And uh, I know Christos, you're in, yes, yeah, see, have sent Christos. I was going to figure out that you would know I have been suspecting for a while that she had cancer and she probably underwent chemo or radiation. And that's why she has an oxygen tank, right? And I saw it. I just so happened I was glancing to the right. I saw her put it in her mouth. But I thought, I mean, I, I, I'm aware that she didn't realize she could be seen, right? So, but she looks much better. She looks healthier. She move, she looks more vibrant, right? And you can see she her hair. And I had suspected maybe. I don't know. Just pray. Obviously, we're not getting younger. And as we get older, our bodies decay. In fact, there are times in which I feel I'm probably going to have a heart attack. That's how I feel sometimes. I don't know if it's the bloating. Sometimes my heart doesn't feel like it's going to last. As long as we die clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not in sin and we're covered by the blood of Jesus, we enter into our everlasting arrest. So, you know, it happens, man. Folks, this is a reminder. Before I begin, let me just remind you. The Lord Jesus doesn't need us. He doesn't need me. We need him. And if he wants to use us, may he be glorified in our lives. And though we glorify him imperfectly, I get complaints all the time. I just got a complaint from someone that I'm too harsh and mean and I insult people. And you know what I told them? Get lost if you don't like it. You don't like it? Get out of here. Don't be a fake thinking you're more spiritual than me. Take a hike. Hit the road, Jack. Yeah. May God have mercy on me and change me for the glory of Jesus Christ. Right? So I could be more like Jesus. But pray for our sister. Pray for our sister. Pray because I don't say this to say it. We don't have many female warriors. We don't have many lionesses. Right? We don't have many lionesses, right? We need more. David Wood here, all he does is he's cure, he cures people of insomnia. Insomnia. So his blessing to the church is that he cures people of insomnia. So if you have insomnia, David Wood's face and his sound will knock you out for weeks. So we thank him for that grace, that he cures insomnia. That will be his legacy. The man who cured insomnia among Christians. But all joking aside, we need to pray for Hatun. May God have mercy on her and speak life to her. 
and give her perfect health and keep her on for many more years to glorify Jesus Christ. Did I preach Christ LA? I don't remember that. So may the Lord Jesus be glorified. May the Lord Jesus bless this session. May the Lord Jesus bless all the workers in the field. May the Lord Jesus save us from our own imperfections and sinfulness and crucify our flesh, not to be a stumbling block, not to justify our sins, but to hate our sins and war against our sins and walk in the life of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. So are you ready? Hopefully this will be my final session on Hebrews 1. And the only reason why I decided to do another session on Hebrews 1 is because of that Jehovah Witness heretic that showed up on my live stream yesterday. I don't know what is it, what it is about this guy. E E, what was it? E E W? I forgot what the W. The guy stalks me, man. What is it about this guy? And I'm I'm I I guarantee you he's listening to me right now. E E W, what do you want with me, dude? If you're not gonna repent of your satanic doctrine and stop worshiping your false god, why are you here? Why are you listening, man? Why are you stalking me? Why are you watching my live streams? And I guarantee you, when I go alive with David Wood, he's going to be there. What do you want, man? You hate the true God. Live with it. The triumph God is God. The triumph God lives. Your God is a false God, a doctrine of Satan. And if you don't want to repent, that's between you and the true God. I got nothing to do with it. But he doesn't stop showing up. So yesterday he showed up. And yesterday he again stuck both his feet in his mouth by making a very foolish comment. Now, I do pray. I don't want that man to be lost. I want God to convict him to repent and worship the triune God who lives and accept Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh. But if he doesn't, why are you here? Right? So he brought up another silly objection that I need to address. Hopefully, I hope, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I'll be done addressing Hebrews 1 because I have multi-part series on Hebrews 1 already. Go back. Through the archives, you're going to see I did many talks on Hebrews 1 and how it decimates and destroys the lie of Joe's witnesses, shows that Jesus is not a created spirit being. He's not the created archangel Michael. He is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, but one with them in essence. I got many talks on that subject, specifically on Hebrews 1, that Christ is the eternal creator. So go back. In the archives, go to my YouTube channel, go through the archives, or just put in Hebrews 1, listen to those sessions, and please do hit the like button. We want more people to come who are sincere and who can put up with me for the sake of Christ to benefit from whatever the Spirit blesses me to speak for the glory of Christ, right? If you've already listened, re-listen and re-re-listen until it becomes second nature so that you can use this information and teach others. See, my goal, guys, don't forget what my goal is. I want you to learn the material. If I say something that is correct and accurate to Scripture, may the Spirit confirm that in your hearts and confirm it in me. Give us the power then to live, live that truth out. Live it for the glory of Jesus and proclaim it. I want you to learn, absorb Make it second nature. Live it out for the glory of Jesus and teach others. That's what I want. Fall more in love with Jesus. Fall more, fall more in love with his word. Know his word. Live it out and teach it. I want every one of you to be Bible teachers by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's do that for the glory of Christ. Learn the material. Right? Learn the material. Make it second nature. Teach it. And my prayer is, Holy Spirit, save me from error. And when I'm mistaken, correct me not to repeat it and save them from all my mistakes. Please, guys, we want more apologists. We want more evangelists. We want more Bible teachers who are qualified. If you're a babe and you're still on milk, teach what you know, but don't <clears throat> delve into areas that you haven't understood and have a grasp of. Teach what you know for the glory of Christ. And then as you mature into spiritual manhood or womanhood because we start as spiritual babes and the holy spirit feeds us spiritually until we become mature men and women in christ when you attain that level of spirituality spiritual maturity where you're now assured of the core doctrines of the christian faith you have an understanding of what those doctrines are and their biblical foundation teach them for the glory of christ and live for the glory of christ please do that that's why we're doing this Haderwood. Myself, 
we're doing this. And I pray God purifies our motives. We're not doing it for the praise of men or for money. May the Lord never allow us to prostitute ourselves for money or fame. We're doing this to equip the body so the body can do this. And you equip others for the glory of Jesus. So please, that's why I have my permission. Upload my, my sessions to your YouTube channel. Make clips out of them. Take my articles. Pass them out. Print them out. Upload them to your websites. Use them for the glory of Jesus. Please do that. For the glory of Jesus. Please. Right? Now, before we begin, let me just get something to drink. And do pray for the apologist that you believe God is using. If you believe that God has called me to ministry and has anointed me in spite of my sins, pray God will help me overcome my sins, walk in holiness, become more like Jesus, and pray for our health. Because I'm one heartbeat away of leaving you. And to be honest with you, better to be with Jesus if we're covered by the blood of Jesus in our everlasting rest, no more pain, no more sin, no more disease, no more gossip, no more slander, no more <clears throat> injustices than to be here. But I'm going to show you what Paul said, and I'll give it to you in a minute. Just let me get something to drink, and we'll begin. We were sailing along. All right, now, let me show you what Paul said. Philippians 1, verses 20 to 25. And by the way, Prot, Protestant, glory to God. I'm not connected to the router or modem. I'm in this room using the internet. And glory to God, it's working, working perfectly. And in Jesus' name, it continues to work perfectly, no buffering. Philippians 1, 20 to 25. Watch here. No, that's Elvis. Watch here what Paul says. Bess, if you're asking me whether the terms themselves appear in the Bible, no. But if you ask me, does the Bible teach that are some sins that don't lead to death and there are, or there's a sin that leads to death because that's what mortal sin is, a sin that will lead you to die? Yes, that's in the Bible. Now, guys, focus with me. Please don't get me off topic. Focus with me. No, this is not Mountain Dew, but do you know what, Debit? I've realized when I drink, Mountain Dew, zero sugar. Every time I drink Diet Mountain Dew or Mountain Dew, zero sugar, I get bloated and it affects my heart. So there's something about that drink that's not good for me. But guys, read with me, please. Yes, sparkling water. Philippians 1, 20 to 25. Don't be afraid. It's not Heineken. Philippians 1, 20, 25. Guys, focus now in Jesus' name. Focus on Philippians 1, verses 20, 25. I am no Apostle Paul. None of us are Apostle Pauls. We're not good enough to even hold his sandals and paul wasn't good enough to lick jesus's sandals so don't think i'm comparison comparing myself to apostle paul may god save me from such arrogance but i want you to see what paul says look what he says here according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing that in nothing i shall be ashamed but with all boldness as always so now also christ will be magnified in my body can we pray those prayers with paul Lord Jesus, be magnified in my body. Let me use my body to glorify you, to worship you, not to sin or shame you. In other words, this is simply Paul's way of saying that Christ will be magnified in my life. When he says in my body, he means in my life, in my earthly life. That in my earthly life, as long as I live on this earth, my desire is to magnify Jesus. Whether by life or by death. The way I live or even the way I die, I want to glorify Jesus. I want my death to bring glory to Jesus. For to me, to live is Christ. Beautiful. You see the wisdom that the Spirit has given Paul to write these words. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm going to explain that, what it means. We'll come back to that. But let me finish it. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. What should I choose? He's saying. Should I depart to be with Christ or should I remain behind? You know, it, it, it's a war. I'm, I'm at war with myself. I'm struggling and wrestling with myself. Do I desire to leave to be with Jesus or do I stay behind for the sake of the Christians? Look what he says. Verse 23. For I am hard pressed between the two, having the desire to be, depart and be with Christ, which is far better. 
Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. You see what he said? You see what my hero said? He goes, I rather depart now and be with Jesus, which is infinitely better than being here. Because then I will see Jesus visibly. I'll see him in his physical glorified body. I will no longer experience temptation and sin. And I will no longer have Satan and his children trying to attack me or kill me. No more struggling with my sinful desires. But now I'll be in a perfect state of rest and peace, being flooded in the infinite love and joy and peace of Jesus, whom I will see in his physical body face to face. That's what I'd rather be. I'd rather be there with him. But for your sake, I remain in the flesh for your benefit so you can prosper. You see, the, you see what he said? You see what he says? For your sake, God is going to keep me around for, for a little while longer. I'm not saying me. I'm not applying this to me. I'm saying what Paul said. Even though if I had a choice, I'd leave and go to be with Jesus. But God in his wisdom has chosen me, Paul, to be used to help you attain spiritual maturity. God has said, you will be my instrument to cause these babes in the faith to attain spiritual maturity. So you're going to remain until I accomplish my purpose in and through you. See what he says? But now let's look at Philippians 121 one more time, real quickly. Amen, John Doe. Look at 1 Philippians 121. Let me explain this, what he's saying. There's meat in Scripture, and I pray the Holy Spirit helps me understand the meat of Scripture. Live it out and teach you for the glory of Christ. Watch Philippians 121. For to me... For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let me explain what that means. And you guys know this, so forgive me if I'm preaching to the choir. He goes, as long as I live in this body, it will be for Jesus. I don't live for myself. Folks, I pray the Holy Spirit will echo this and etch it in your hearts as the Spirit guides me to talk about this. Understand that you as a Christian, you've been bought by the blood of Christ. You belong to him. Paul is saying, my earthly life is all about glorifying Christ. My life is about Jesus on earth. My life is not, is not about me, my desires, my goals, my wishes, my pleasure. The life I live on earth is all about Jesus, his desires, his goals, his pleasure, his glory. I live for Christ, and I live to bring him glory. I live to obey his commands. I live to bring about his will on earth. What he wants, I do. What he doesn't want, I refrain and I speak out against. So you don't live for your job. You don't live even for your family. You don't live for your spouse. You don't live for your children. You don't live for making money. You don't live for, for your health. You don't live for anything other than Christ. That's what Paul is saying. So in every field of my life, Christ is first. When I go to work, and again, it's easier said than done. So don't think I, I'm a hypocrite. May God save me from my hypocrisy. I'm just saying easier said than done. I know. But what Paul is saying is when I wake up that morning and I head to work, my goal is how can I glorify Jesus at my job? What must I do to make sure I don't dishonor Jesus, shame Jesus in the eyes of my co-workers, fellow workers, but give him the utmost glory possible when I'm working in a secular job? See, that's the attitude, right? Yep, he was a tent maker. You understand what he's saying? So some of you won't be called in full-time ministry. Some of you won't be called to be pastors or priests. Some of you won't be called to be missionaries. But you are called to live for Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So even if you are an employee of a company, when you work, you're not working so much for your boss or for yourself. You're working for the glory of Jesus. So your attitude should be, what can I possibly do today to bring Jesus more glory than I did yesterday and bring him more glory tomorrow 
in the workplace so I don't cause anyone to stumble and disgrace Jesus in the eyes of the unbelievers that I'm working with. You understand? And I know, guys, it's easier said than done, but let that be your desire and your prayer. Holy Spirit, this is my desire. Please give me the power to do it. And that's what I pray. I say, Holy Spirit, you know my struggles, these sinful passions, and you know my impatience and anger. Save me from these things so I don't shame Jesus and cause people to stumble. And I fail, but may the Lord have mercy on me. Philippians 1, verses 20 to 25, Pedro, but specifically Philippians 1, verse 21. Right? You see why I say Paul is my hero? I love him. I pray in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we all become like Paul. That we have Pauls in our midst and we have Paulas, female Pauls. And I will tell you who's a female Paul. Let another man praise you and not yourself. We have a female Paul right now, Hatun Tash, who's willing to die for the glory of Jesus. Right? But you know what? We need more female Pauls. Women, sisters in the Lord, pray and ask the Spirit to confirm. Are you called to be in ministry and to devote yourself entirely to ministry? Some of you, folks, don't, let me explain so I don't confuse you. I really want to speak to you on a practical level. Being a full-time mom is ministry for the Lord. Being a full-time housewife is ministry to the Lord. Being a father is ministry to the Lord. Being a good husband, anything you do is ministry. So don't think. That you have to be in full-time ministry where you write and you teach and you do YouTube sessions. That somehow you're not in ministry. You're all in ministry because everything you do is ministry to the Lord. Everything you do must have in mind the focus that I am ministering to others for the sake of the Lord. So when I minister to my children, it's because of Jesus. I want to be the best mom possible for my kids to glorify Jesus. I want to be the best wife possible to my husband to glorify Jesus. And the dad says, I want to be the best dad possible. To Anything you do, and it's a fact. I'm not just saying it. It is the truth of Scripture. Why do you think the Bible is full, full of references to husbands, how to treat your wives, wives, how to treat your husbands, parents, how to raise your children, children, how to honor your parents, Slaves, how to honor your masters. Masters, how to treat your slaves. Because everything in life has to be ministry. I'm not lying. This is the, don't believe me? Read Ephesians. Read Ephesians and see all the instructions that Paul has for parents, for children, for spouses, for slaves and masters. Because whether you like it or not, slavery was a part of life back then. And it's still part of life Today, you with me there? So don't think you women who are working to take care of your children or are full-time moms, you're not doing ministry. You are doing ministry. And mothers, let me say something to you. Let me speak to you, and I pray it's from the Holy Spirit. You have the greatest responsibility. You know why? Because God has entrusted in your care future Paul's, Future Peters, future Johns, future Stevens, future <clears throat> Phillips, those children in your hand, you do not know what they will turn out to be. God has entrusted to you his children for you to mold so they can become the next generation of lions and lionesses for Jesus. You know that? You're given that honor. You're given that honor. One of you may be the mother of the next Paul. When I say Paul, I'm not saying inspired like Paul, receiving revelation the way Paul did, that became part of the foundation that the church was built upon. But you know what I mean. A Paul in his zeal and love to glorify Jesus, preach Jesus, and die for Jesus. Right? Right? You mothers have the greatest responsibility and honor and gift. 
You do not know if you have a Peter in your midst, a Paul in your midst. Let's let's go a little further. Let's not talk about the apostles. You don't know if you have the next Athanasius in your midst or the next Irenaeus in your midst or if you want even modern example, Billy Graham. Nobody hates Billy Graham. So he's neutral. Everyone loves Billy Graham. Why do you think, women, society is destroying motherhood, is destroying <clears throat> biblical values when it comes to traditional family and traditional marriage? Because they know, Satan knows, if I destroy the household, the family structure, and I destroy biblical motherhood and womanhood, then I destroy children, and then they produce a bunch of misfits trying to run the country. So women become men, and men become women. Women become masculinized, and men become feminized. And this is why you have a bunch of children growing up to be psychological, emotional misfits. Look around you. I am shocked. And by the way, don't misquote me here. I want you to misquote me. I'm not saying having a tattoo is necessarily sin. It's the type of tattoo you may have. But I'm act actually astonished and shocked at how prevalent tattoos are. You can't go out and not see, out of every 10 individuals, about seven or eight are tattooed from head to toe. What happened to this society? Astonishing. In the 70s and 80s when I was young, I would hardly see anyone with tattoos. Now I can't help but see people with tattoos. And when I see someone without a tattoo, I'm shocked. In my days, when someone had a tattoo, it was shocking. Now today, when someone doesn't have a tattoo, it's shocking. Isn't it amazing? Anyway, what was the point of this talk so we can begin? <clears throat> Paul says, as long as I live on earth, as long as I live on earth, for, for as long as I live on earth, and as long as I live on earth, my entire life will be devoted to glorifying Jesus Christ. Exactly, Ariel. If you have a tattoo for vanity, a tattoo that promotes values other than Christian values, biblical values, then it is a sin. Uh, yeah. So notice what I said. I'm not saying a tattoo is a sin. It depends on the kind of tattoo and why you have it. Right? So what am I getting at? Paul says... As long as Jesus gives me breath in my lungs and a heartbeat to live in this world, I will do everything I can by the power of the Holy Spirit to live it for Jesus Christ. Not about my bank account, not about how many cars I can have or getting the latest, newest car. Or That's not why I'm here. I'm not here to store up riches on earth. I'm not here saving money so I can get a brand new 2021 car, you know, 2021 model, whatever it may be. Lexus, I'm not here for that. I'm here to use all the resources God has given me and all the money that God has given me, everything that God has given me to use those resources to make Jesus known and to be used of the Spirit to see People fall in love with Jesus so they can comprehend how beautiful, how attractive, how irresi irresistible Jesus is. And then I'm ready to go home. So just remember that, folks. Remember that. That's Philippians 121. Hunter, the reason why we prefer earthly desires is because, brother, we're born in the flesh and for most of our life, what have we done but engage and indulge the flesh, right? So indulging the flesh has become second nature, Hunter. It now has become instinctive. We sin instinctively. 
We gravitate to fleshly desires instinctively because that's all we've been doing. So what's unnatural is for someone fleshly to now resist those natural, instinctive, sinful cravings and walk in the spirit. That's where it takes work. So we have to walk so closely in union with the spirit so that now doing things of the spirit becomes instinctive and second nature. And then doing things of the flesh becomes a natural. You have to unlearn indulging the flesh and discipline yourself to walk in the spirit so that walking in the spirit becomes second nature and then indulging the flesh becomes unnatural to you. But that's why the Bible says that spiritual discipline, spiritual exercise, spiritual training. It's like going to the gym. It is unnatural for people who've been lazy all their life to go in the gym and spend two hours hitting weights. But then after a while, and this is the truth, you can see it in my brother. My brother is 55 years old. He's still a muscular behemoth. You know why? He started weight training in his late teens. He's 55. Hitting weights is now like breathing oxygen. It's second nature to him. He has done it so much that now it's instinctive so that when he doesn't do it, he doesn't feel healthy or normal. That's the spiritual life. You have to exercise your spiritual muscles and engage in intense spiritual discipline by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you reach a point that now doing the things of the Spirit are now instinctive and natural and no longer unnatural. Exactly, Ariel. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Notice what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receive the prize? And Paul is likening the Christian life to a marathon. You're running in a coliseum, a marathon, right? You're running. Run in such a way that you may obtain that prize. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things, meaning self-control. He controls himself, right? Disciplines himself. He doesn't lack self-control or discipline. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it to obtain an imperishable crown, a crown that never perishes. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus, I fight, not as one who beats the air, shadow boxing, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. In Jesus' name, I pray I don't disqualify myself. Lord, save me, please. Do you see what Paul said? He just told you your spiritual walk is a life of intense spiritual training and discipline. So guess who are the movers and shakers of the world? Those who deliberately, intentionally engage in intense spiritual exercises, praying faithfully, fasting, meditating on scripture, reciting scripture, engaging in spiritual worship, going out there and serving the poor, the needy, the widow, and preaching. The more you do that, the more discipline, the more spiritual you become, and the less likely you'll be in succumbing to your fleshly desires. That's it. Now, let me show you how Paul describes the end of his life. And a ring in the nose, that was just the customs at that time. This is what like the dowry system, Anna, where you would give a nose ring as a gift to your bride. Because in, I don't know, in Greek, right? You, Greeks, you do it too. The dowry where you pay a money for the bride. So the ring nose, just like Rebecca, that was a custom that you'd give your bride-to-be a ring nose because this was your way of paying her parents to marry their daughter, the mahar, the dowry. Yeah, Anna. Anyway, but thank you, Anna, for bringing that up. I appreciate it. In the midst of, I love you, sister. Remember, you're my sister. You're orthodox. That means you're hot-blooded and fiery. I don't want you to punish me. But focusing on, notice how Paul ends 
his ministry, how he describes the finality of his earthly life. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. And we're going to begin. Exactly, Dennis. I know, my friend. Dennis, and I want to share some with you. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 to 8. Guys, read with me. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. See, my life is being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice of Christ. Notice what he's describing your life of discipline. Your life of discipline is a sacrifice to God. A sacrifice acceptable to God. That God delights in. Now watch. And the time of my departure is at hand. Guys, pay attention. And the time of my departure is at hand. Now notice how he describes the finality of his ministry. I have fought the good fight like a boxer. Remember 1 Corinthians 9? I have finished the race. Remember he says I won the race? I've finished the race. And I've reached the goal line, which is heaven. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on the day and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You see what he just said? Timothy, and it should make you cry, because this is Paul's last letter to Timothy. He did encourage Timothy to come see him before he got beheaded. Church tradition says Paul was beheaded for the glory of Christ, because he's in prison writing this. So you know what he says, Timothy? Timothy, I hope you get here before I die and enter glory, because I want to see you. So I'm going to cry too. I want to see you, my son, a final time. 2 Timothy 1, 2. Notice what he calls Timothy. Look what he calls Timothy. Yeah, I'm not making it up, folks. Watch here. 2 Timothy 1, verse 2. Notice what he says here. Tradition suggests that he was freed the first time and may have traveled to Spain. Timothy, a beloved son. Timothy, a beloved son. You see how he calls Timothy? Timothy, my spiritual son. Now, we know Paul wasn't married, had no children, meaning physical children. He had spiritual children. He was a spiritual father. And one of his spiritual sons was Timothy. Yeah, yeah, in fact, you guys are going to make me cry. You keep talking like that. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, <clears throat> the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see what he says to Timothy? He goes, my son, Timothy, I hope. I hope, <clears throat> I hope I see you a final time. But Timothy, know this, my son. <clears throat> yeah, too many onions here. <clears throat> know this. Here's my legacy that I leave for you. Timothy, I fought the good fight. <clears throat> I have run the race. I have reached the finish line. And now my Lord Jesus, my beautiful, precious Jesus, has a crown <clears throat> that he's going to place on me. Okay, so that's, that's what he said, see? But notice he describes it as a race where it requires discipline, right? Isn't that amazing? Isn't he amazing what he said? You see why I love him? <clears throat> You see why I love this man? I love him. It's an honor that I could be his brother in Jesus Christ. That because of the grace of God's spirit, I believe I'm born of the spirit and I belong to Christ. He's my brother and I love him. I've said this to you. I'll say it again. If the Lord is pleased to take me into his everlasting arms when my time comes in spite of my failures, May have mercy on me and save me from my own sins and failures. The two individuals I want to see, if the Lord counts me worthy by his grace, <clears throat> I'm not worthy to be in their company. The two individuals I want to see, I want to see his blessed mother, our mother by faith in Christ, his blessed mother whom I love and adore, and I want to see Paul. I want to see Paul. <clears throat>
<clears throat> and tell them I love them. Anyway, hope you got it now. Uh, so, anyway, with that said, by the grace of God, with that said, that's what, yeah, exactly, Alan. Why do you think I get so angry and livid when Muslims attack Paul? This is why I have no mercy on their prophet. Let me put it this way. Muhammad, Muhammad is not worthy to lick the sandals of Paul, and Paul was not worthy to lick the sandals of Jesus. So what does that tell you about Muhammad? Because they think, Zina, Paul is the one who corrupted Christianity. Whereas Paul is a warrior of Jesus. And Muhammad is not worthy to lick the sandals of Paul. Now, with that said, guys, let me give you these two articles I just finished. Because I'm on a journey, and I'm trusting the Spirit to guide my journey. Until I enter Christ's presence. And I'm asking the Spirit to guide me into all truth and save me from error. I just posted a two-part Post, post the two-part post here, where I quote early church documents, early church sources showing, guys, don't you don't have to be Catholic or Orthodox or Assyrian Church of the East or Coptic to believe this is something that doesn't contradict Scripture, but something acceptable to God. Because you even have Episcopalians and Lutherans that do it. Let me just share a story with you guys, if you don't mind, <clears throat> so we can begin then our discussion. Years ago, I had prayed, and I asked the Lord, and I said, Lord, I just want to know if doing the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, I know different churches do it differently. We're not going to get into that. Um, if it's acceptable to you and pleasing to you, Lord, please show me. I don't want to do something that doesn't please you. I want to do something that pleases you. Now, the Lord works in his own timing. You want an answer overnight. The Lord didn't answer me for years. Finally... I believe now I've gotten the answer. So now I went, did some research. Thank God for the internet. Thank God for these websites. I wanted to know how early, how early this practice of doing the sign of the cross happened to be. And I found that this practice, you can document, goes way back at least to the start of the second century in the 100s. Showing you that this practice of doing the sign of the cross is very early and widespread. There's nothing in scripture that condemns it. It doesn't contradict scripture. And the very fact that you find this practice wide, I'm talking about all over the then known Christian world, among all the different bodies of Jesus Christ, and early now gives me peace. And now... <clears throat> I'm at complete rest that doing the sign of the cross, the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, is something that is not contrary to Scripture and something that God has God's approval and blessing. And so here are the sources. Here it is. This is the first link. Okay, that's the first link right there. And let me give you the second link. The second link, I quote, a variety of church writers, church fathers, from different locations, some in Africa, others in other places. And they all have this in common. In all these different centers of Christianity, very early on, they all speak of using your hand to do the sign of the cross and how the sign of the cross wards off demons, that even demons flee when a heart filled with genuine faith and love in Jesus does the sign of the cross. So for me, that's it. I'm convinced. I'm at peace and I'm at ease with it. So there he goes. Here's the second article. Okay? That's the second article. Now, that evidence convinces me, right? It is ancient, widespread, and therefore acceptable to God and uh, blessed by God because these men of God and women of God were doing it all over the then Christian world. I now am perfectly fine with it. I have no objections to it. Now, if you disagree with me, that's fine. That's between you and the Lord. 
I've spent years wrestling with this issue, and this is the point I've reached, and I trust the Spirit will guide me into all truth, and if I'm mistaken, he'll correct me for the glory of Christ. So now I'm at peace. That's it. Satisfied. Now that said, let's go into Hebrews 1. Oh, good. See, even she has the same questions, and she's getting answered through my journey. Now you pray for me and you. That God will save us from error and guide me into all truth. Okay, so you got the articles now. Widespread and early. Widespread and early. Which means it doesn't contradict scripture because there's nothing scripture condemns it. And the very fact it's widespread and early among all these Christians, many of whom were disciples of the disciples of the apostles, show that God has honored this practice and blessed this practice. All glory to the triumph God, right? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now, don't get into a debate with me how to do it. I know that they, they do it differently. It's just no waste my time on that, okay? So I'm going to have no idea why, honestly. If you ask me, I don't know. Being too, too much. And you know what's ironic, Sedeman? There are Protestants, the Episcopalian Lutheran, that do the sign of the cross. So it's not a non-Protestant practice. you got Protestants who even do it. So I'm wondering why I hesitated to do it. And I think it's because when we go to evangelical churches, we don't see people doing it, and we feel awkward when we do it, right? Because no one else is doing it, right? You go to an evangelical church, they don't do the sign of the cross, and you feel awkward. Man, if I do it, what are they going to say? Are they going to judge me? You know what I say to them? I'm going to say Jiru style. Are you ready, Sergun? Jiru style. And we're going to begin. Are you ready? You know what I say to them? I'll go in an evangelical church. I'm going to do name of the Father, the Holy Spirit. And if they look at me, I'm going to do doubt. I got me. 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 Dat doubt. Jiru style. For those of you who don't know Jiru style, let me tell you what I said. I said, if they look at me weird, I'm going to say, your mother's mother. I don't know, LD, right? So who's going to say anything about it? Your mother's mother. I'll take this cane and I'll bust your dad's skull open. And I'll pluck out his eyes. You poor thing. I said that in Jiru. Okay. That was a rough translation. That was more of a paraphrase. Christos Anesti. Hank Canagraph is on, on his own journey. Let me comment real quickly. You guys know, and I say this before you, and I know people are not going to be happy with me, my Protestant brothers. That's okay. I love them, right? And I'm a biblicist. I want to be as faithful to Scripture as possible. I don't have a problem with someone becoming Orthodox. I don't have a problem with someone becoming Roman Catholic who is evangelical. You know what my problem is with Hank Hanegraaff? Hank Hanegraaff is the Bible answer man. He became Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. Do you know why I have a problem with Hank Hanegraaff? Here's my reason. I have a problem with him. I don't have a problem. I don't. If someone wants to become Orthodox, he's convinced that's the true expression of the Christian faith or Roman Catholic. If you had asked me this maybe 15 years ago, I'd have a problem. I don't anymore. I don't. My problem with him is, is that the Bible Answer Man show was started by Walter Martin. And Walter Martin was an evangelical Protestant who believed sola scriptura, sola fide. So if Hank has now become Orthodox, he either needs to change the name of the show or stop being the Bible Answer Man. Because you can't be sola scriptura and sola fide and a devout orthodox. And the orthodox will tell you, am I lying? The orthodox are here. Am I lying? They'll tell you. You can't affirm sola scriptura, sola fide, because these are uniquely Protestant doctrines. Unique doctrines of the Protestant Reformation. Okay. So now change the name of your station. Or leave it because the founder of the Bible Answer Man, look, don't, this is not a debate. Go do the research. Walter Martin, Ariel and Alan Ruhl, no, did not Walter Martin debate Roman Catholics like Father Mitchell Pacwa on the John Ankerberg show? Right? Because, well, and you can, by the way, you can find those debates on YouTube. Because Walter Martin was an evangelical Protestant, he believed sola scriptura. The Bible is a soul, infallible rule of faith. And sola fide, you're justified by faith alone. The Orthodox does not believe that. 
The Roman Catholic Church does not believe that. The Coptic Church does not believe that. The Assyrian Church, they don't believe in sola scriptura, sola fide. All right. Hank Hedegraaff started as an evangelical Protestant, continuing in the footsteps of Walter Martin, basing the program on the same principles that Walter Martin based his program upon. Now that you've become Orthodox, either abandon your position or change the name of the station. Be true to the spirit of the founder. That's it. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Orthodox Christians, if I had an Orthodox apologetics channel and I became Protestant, how many of you would be happy with me still calling it an Orthodox apologetics channel? You'd say, Guy, change the name of your channel. You do not affirm what the church teaches. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, we do not accept. Turn it into something other than Orthodox apologetic channel. See, that's my only problem with Hank Hanegraaff. That's it. That's it. That's my only problem with him. Right? But he brings in this convert to the Orthodox Church. I don't know his name. Very pleasant, very well-informed, very intelligent speaker. I enjoy that person. He's done some podcasts with him. I just don't know his name. A very articulate, articulate intelligent Orthodox Christian. Faith, love, I, you still don't get it, my brother. My brother, you're still not getting it. Even though we're doing it all for the glory of Christ, there are still differences among the churches where complete unity will not exist on this side of eternity. Faith, love, let's not be delusional. Let's be honest. There are differences between Catholic and Orthodox that will not be resolved on this side of glory until Jesus returns. There's difference, difference between Protestants and Catholics that won't be resolved on this side of glory until Jesus returns. There are differences between Roman Catholics and Assyrian Church of the East. We have differences, and there are differences among Protestants that will not be resolved until Jesus returns. This is just a fact. We can't live in la-la land and be delusional, right? We can't be la-la-la, it's a utopia and it's a perfect world. No, we're in a fallen world. There are going to be differences until Jesus returns. But you know what the beauty about these differences are? Can I show you the wisdom of God? Why he's permitted these differences? Do you know why? Because these differences brings us out of our comfort zone. These differences forces us to stop being lazy and now pour into the scriptures with greater depth and search church history. In fact, had it not been for my brother in Christ, James White, debating Roman Catholics, I would have no clue about the church fathers and the differences. So those debates put me on a journey to say, hey, wow, wait. Athanasius? Who's he? Tertullian? Tur who? Sounds like, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, sounds like some Mexican dish. Tor you know, tortillas, not trying to, honestly, uh, Tertullian, who's he? Irenaeus, right? Ignatius, Cyril, who are these folks, man? How come I don't know about them? So these debates sharpened me. So why the differences? The differences will force you. If you love Jesus and you love his word, it will force you to then dig deeper into the scriptures and history. Did you know that? Up until these debates, I had no clue about who these men are. And I still don't know much of what they taught and wrote because they wrote too much. I don't have time to read. So I'm, I read people who quote them and then I try to go find the context of those quotes like I did with the signing of the cross. But this made me a more sharper, a more informed Christian. So this is why God in his wisdom has allowed these differences. Because when you hear another perspective, why do you believe that? Oh, because the Bible, where in the Bible? Oh, because the early church, where in the early church? Folks, I'm going to shock you. I'm going to do a session, maybe multiple sessions, and I'm going to write a paper where I'm going to show you that one of the Unanimous teachings of the early church, and you'll find support from this from the start of the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century. 
One, one doctrine that we know they all held in common. You know what they believe? Can I shock some of my Protestant brothers and sisters? And I learned this because of the debates between James White, other Protestants, and Roman Catholics. I used to watch Jerry Matadix, Robert Genis <clears throat> debate on Patrick Madrid. And what's the other gentleman's name? He was a Pentecostal minister. Man, it slips my mind. Jerry Matadix, Robert Genis, <clears throat> Patrick Madrid, even Carl Keating. I've seen one of Carl Keating's debates with Ecclesia Ni Cristo. Tim Staples. Yeah. I've watched those debates. And I've watched them debate James White. And I've watched them debate. His name's Lewis. Anyway, get, you get the point. Anyway, now, there is one doctrine, one doctrine that you'll find held universally by the churches. And you'll find evidence from this in the second century. Did you know that from at least the second century onwards, and it's in the Nicene Creed, and I hope I'm not boring you with this information. Peter Williams is phenomenal. He did, he, that debate with James White, Ariel, with Peter Williams, the light switch went on. The light bulb, I should say, went on because he said something that I've been struggling with and he articulated in such a fa fashion. I went, wow, that's what I was looking for. Do you know that, Ariel? It was this debate with James White on the Marian doctrines when he mentioned census fidelium. That's what I was struggling with, but I didn't know how to put it in words. And he put it in words for me. Census fidelium. When he said that, I go, that's what I've been wrestling with. Okay, now, getting back to the point. Yep, the UK debate. It's in the Nicene Creed. The church fathers believe that when you baptize someone in water, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that act of water baptism was a means by which God would remove the stain of original sin and cause you to be born of the Spirit. So for them, water baptism regenerated you, made you alive in the spirit, and removed the stain of sin that you inherited from Adam and Eve. Do you know they believe that? It washed you of your sin. So to them, water baptism wasn't simply symbolic. <whistles> no, Pedro, they didn't. I can't lie to you. You want me to be honest to God and honest to church history, right? This is the honor. I promise you, Lord willing, in the upcoming weeks, I'm going to compile all the citations I can find in one article on my blog, and I'm going to talk about it. Well, if you go to the Didache Christian Wall, it says, if you have living, running water, you immerse them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Depends on the circumstances. I promise you I'll do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to show you here's church history. Here's what these Christian men believe. Here's what they believe. And you want proof that this was the view of the church? In the Nicene Creed, in the Nicene Creed, you know what it says, guys? I believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, why should I, QWERTY? Why don't you go address them if you're concerned about them? Don't waste my time and don't be used of the devil. Okay, did you catch what I just said? In the Nicene Creed, it says, I believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And historically, what they meant, even the heretics believe this, even Arius believe this. What they meant is water baptism was used by God to forgive you of your sins. And by that time, they believed an infant water baptism so that when they baptize infants, God washed them of the sin that they would have received from Adam and Eve. It's a fact. I, I'm not lying to you. Guys, can you quote that part of the Nicene Creeds if people think I'm lying? 
Because I know people think I'm lying here. Yeah, yeah, Christos, I'm not lying to you, bro. You guys want me to be as honest to Scripture as possible, even though I'm an imperfect sinner, and people hate me and think that God is going to judge me because I'm a wicked, arrogant, you know. Can someone quote that part of the creed and give the link? Right? Can someone do that for me before I move on? I may have to change the title of this discussion because I may, I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Let me get it for you. If you guys can't do an arrow, can you do it? It's in the Nicene Creed. In the Nicene Creed. Yeah, it's in the Nicene Creed. Someone can do that for me real quick. If not, I'll do it. I'll find it. It's online. It's online. The Nicene Creed is online. Give us a link to it. Let me, let me get it for you. Here, let me do it for you. Let me give you a link. Born and heat and heat and ride and crawl. Here, I'm going to, I'm even going to quote it to you from the Christian Reformed Church, a Protestant church, so you don't see its bias. Guys, here you go. Ortho Christos, he quoted it in Greek. And Protestant believer gave you the link. Here is the link to, and me and Protestant gave you the same link. Now, this is a Protestant church. Guys, click on the link. Protestant church that recites the Nicene Creed. Now, let me show you what it says in the creed, okay? Let me get it for you. Ra 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 ro 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 ra. Heat and ride and crawl. Last paragraph, folks. Had it, nephew. Here it is. Had it, nephew. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Let me post it three times. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Let me challenge all my brothers and sisters. Now, guys, you know I still affirm sola fide, sola scriptura, even though many don't believe it here. Bratit Mshicha, everyone else. I want you to go to your evangelical churches. Mention this part of the creed to your pastor. Say, the creed says, I believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And they meant water baptism. Do you hold to that? Most likely he'll say no, unless he's Lutheran, Episcopalian, or Church of Christ. Say, so then what do you say about this creed? This creed is recited by all the major branches of Christianity, Assyrian Church of the East, Orthodox, there's a debate on, and from the sun, but put that aside, Roman Catholic, and Protestant churches, you'll find this creed in their hymnals. You'll at least find Episcopalians and Lutherans, right? Lutherans, Anglicans reciting it. You got it? So right there, folks. La, 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 la. Put him in and hit and run and crawl. How many of you are shocked? How many of you are shocked? Okay. You shocked? Folks, can I share something with you? You know those of us who believe that water baptism symbolizes, represents our union with Jesus Christ, but doesn't confer forgiveness of sin regeneration? You know, if we're living in the fourth century... We'd be condemned as a heretics and thrown out of the church. Did you know that? All of us who say that water baptism represents, symbolizes our union with Jesus Christ, but it doesn't confer regeneration, forgiveness sins, we would have been thrown out of the church in the fourth century as heretics, and we would not be allowed in the church and not allowed to take communion. Did you know that? So let me ask my... Evangelical brothers and sisters here, let me challenge you. If you believe water baptism regenerates and forgiveness is a false teaching, if you believe that those who say water baptism regenerates you, causes you to be born of the Spirit and forgives you your sins, is a damnable doctrine, are you saying that the early church, men like Athanasius, who defended the true faith, against heretics and was willing to die for it. And this was the belief of the church universal. Even the heretics agreed. They were heretics and lost and were not saved. I don't think you want to say that. You do not want to say that. See? If Athanasius ain't in heaven, I doubt any of us are going to be in heaven. If he didn't make it, I mean, I ain't making it. Yep. Even the Aryan heretics, Hunter, 
Arius believed in water baptism. That wasn't a debate. And the Orthodox and the Catholic can correct me here. Arius did not disagree with the Orthodox, the true believers, that water baptism regenerates. He accepted that. His debate was whether Jesus is eternally God or the first creation of the Father. Yeah, I'm not lying, man. Guys, I mean, if this is too much, I won't talk about it because I don't want to cause people to stumble. I really don't want to be a stumble to any one of you, but I want to be honest. Right? Right? I, I, I want to be honest with you guys. Right? So this is why these are the things that messed me up for years. Let me be honest with you. These are the things that messed me up for years and caused me internal grief and turmoil. Because you know why? I kept saying, why would I condemn a person today for believing that water baptism regenerates and grants forgiveness of sin and not condemn these church fathers? Why am I being inconsistent? If this is damnable today, why wasn't it damnable back then? And some of the arguments, you know what some of the arguments were? Let me refute them arguments. Can I refute the arguments? Oh, but you see, at that time, they were too busy dealing with other controversies. So they really didn't know sola fide. That took centuries. So now that sola fide has been discovered and articulated, people who now know of sola fide and reject it, they are blameworthy, but not the fathers before them. Let me shut down that argument. Can I shut down that argument? Can I tell I, I, I said, man, I used to think of that argument and say, wait, 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 hold on. Can I shut down that argument? Tell you why that's a bad argument? Number one, if sola fide is the heart of the gospel, and yet you have many fathers, I won't say all, who did not know sola fide, as articulated by Martin Luther, that you're declared righteous by faith alone, that means there was no gospel. So then how did any of them get saved? You see the inconsistency. You can't tell me in one breath sola fide is the heart of the gospel, and the gospel saves you. And then tell me that these men cannot be blamed for not knowing what sola fide is. Because if sola fide is the gospel, they didn't know the gospel. How did they get saved? How did they get saved? Number two. Number two. Even Martin Luther, who believed in sola fide, Believed in water baptismal regeneration, right? Am I correct, guys? Maybe I'm wrong. And isn't it true that Lutherans believe that? I may be wrong. I'm not an expert on Lutheranism. So Martin Luther also believed in infant baptismal regeneration. He believed in infant baptismal regeneration. And yet he affirmed sola fide. Okay. Folks. Folks. It's these kind of issues that cause me to start rethinking and put my guards down. You know what? Enough. Enough of me being so inconsistent and thinking that Rome doesn't have the true gospel. Enough of me of being inconsistent and thinking that the or enough. I'm done. I'm done. My commitment is not to anyone but to Jesus Christ and his word and his faithfulness. That's where I stand. That's where I stand. Where do you want me to go, Adrian? I'll go wherever you want me to go. Because I can't be consistent in condemning, let's say, someone, let's say a Protestant who believes in water baptism or generation, and then yet say Athanasius was a great man, a holy servant of Christ, and he believed in water baptism or regeneration, dude. I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. May the Lord have mercy on me. I hope I don't offend people. And if people want to do videos attacking me and say, hey, he's a Jesuit plant, that's fine. It's all right. I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. Right? And even, Hunter, you'll have even Roman Catholics who will tell you there have been abuses in the church. That the Roman Catholic Church, there have been abuses and corruptions. They'll tell you. Even today, they're here. you got Catholics. They'll tell you this pope here is a nightmare. And that's why you have even Catholics, some women call him the Pope, will say Francis, that he's a leftist Marxist who's doing great damage to the Catholic Church. And one of the guys who's passionately zealous for the Roman Catholic Church 
who loves the Catholic Church, so you can't accuse him of being anti-Catholic, Michael Voris of Church Militant, go and watch his expose on Pope Francis. This is a Roman Catholic exposing this man as corrupt. Church Militant. Okay. So that said, with all that in the background, can we... Yeah, 315. Okay. Can we get into the topic? A Protestant... Can you edit this into two videos? Because there was one video you're going to edit into, but I know you're a busy man. You never got around to it. So, because we're going to have to cut this down in two. We're going to have to retitle. So time it, the first, whatever, 80 minutes, something else. And then this last part will be about Christ and angels. I'm a getting there. I'm a getting there. P pray for Protestant. He just put a thumbnail that was beautiful. He's the one who puts all these beautiful thumbnails for my videos. He edits them, and he makes it professional. He doesn't get paid. His reward is with Jesus Christ. Okay, so with that said, are we ready now to go into the topic? And don't forget, I have a session with Hater Wood who's going to put me to sleep. Guys, do pray for me because Satan is really trying to attack me worse now. There's more attacks. More people trying to dig dirt and try to condemn me, even for my past sins. May the Lord have mercy on me. Pray God will sustain me and preserve me and cover me by the blood of Jesus and that I won't be discouraged, but that will sustain me to do this for his glory until my dying breath. Because the attacks are coming. They're coming from different quarters, right? The demons are aw awoken. So pray Jesus protect me. People trying to be dirty and trying to get involved in my nasty divorce with my ex-wife and use that to slander me, right? But those who know me in my situation will know. Like Bratit and Sheikh and Aldi, they know what happened. But there are those who don't and are dying to find dirt on me, to discredit me and shame me and, you know, slander me. But that's okay. May the Lord Jesus preserve me. If he wants me to teach, his will be done. He doesn't need me. I need him. So now, with that said, guys, let's now regroup, refocus, Opa, last night, Christian? You too? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sai Christian, guys, this guy here, this guy is one of my best buddies. He's a brother from my heart, even though he gets me angry and wants me to commit suicide by hanging myself with my shoestrings. He knows my situation better than anyone else. He knows how corrupt and wicked this judge is and how she's destroyed men and <clears throat> emboldened women, even adulterous women, who've destroyed their families. Now, Sai Christian is here. He knows it. Am I lying, Sai Christian? He's right here. He'll tell you, unfortunately. And pray for him, Sai Christian. Pray for him. Pray God will bless him. Pray God will preserve him. Pray God will bless his eight children. He's got eight children. But pray God will shine his face on his eight children, bring every one of them to salvation in Jesus Christ. Pray God will bless his mother. And I don't say in front of him, he's got a wonderful mother. A saintly mother. And I'm not saying it in front of him. I love his mother. She's a wonderful woman. I don't know how she raised up such a son. She's so wonderful and she's got a misfit for a son. But that's beside the point. Don't let him be a reflection on his mother. Pray for his mother. God knows his name. I don't want to give out his name. But you know him as Sahih Christian. Pray for his eight wonderful children. Pray for his mother. Uh, Sahih Christian, you are proof that you can have an amazing mother and still have a child that's a misfit. Poor mother. Meskina Dao. Meskina Dao. All right, anyway. Let's regroup by the grace of Jesus Christ. So they ready? Let's focus. So he didn't deny it either. He goes, you're right, man. You, you know, I'm, I, you've given your mother, Sai Christian. Yeah, hey, by the way, Sai, Aldi is in here. Guys, Aldi is also a brother from my heart, one of my best friends, and he knows my situation. Aldi and Sai Christian say hi to each other. By the way, Sai Christian, I have to say this. You have given your mother a taste of purgatory. The purging she's gone through and raising you, she needs all the prayers she can get. Okay, Sai Christian, just want you to know that. Friend. Poor woman. Yeah, but in all honesty, she is a wonderful woman. And, uh, and again, I have to say this. Al D right here, God is my witness, folks. I'm not praising their mothers because they're here. Al D's mother, she is a wonderful woman too, an amazing woman, a saintly woman. 
who's kept a family going, a remarkable woman. Pray for Al D, pray for his wife, pray for his children, pray for his mother and assembly. Kurti, I'm going to answer you, then I'm going to send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone like a pagan. Do you know I have challenged, don't convert to Islam to debate me? And the coward is like you, he runs and hides behind his wife's mirth, like Muhammad used to hide in Aisha's mirth. Kurti, stop being a little girl and asking me to debate men and running to men to defend you and your false prophet. Or I'm going to send you to the black stone so you can smooch it like the pagan you are. Smoochy, smoochy. Smooch, smooch. Hey, hold on, heat and heat around, crop. Smoochy. All right, let's go. Let's begin in Jesus' name. What's the issue with Hebrews 1? Guys, we're going to cut this YouTube session into two. Yeah, I like DJ next. We were saying it all. We're going to cut it into two, God willing, hopefully with this in this week, Protestant. If you have time, we're going to make this into two sessions. The first half, something else, second half, Hebrews 1, Jesus and angelic creatures. Why am I revisiting this issue? Logos. Yesterday, our Jehovah Witness friend, our demonized friend who can't keep away from me, EEW, showed up and had to open his mouth so I can spank him some more. He claimed, if you guys remember yesterday's session, near the end, he says, Jesus is not a man in heaven and that he believes that Jesus is the Archangel Michael, a creature. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you an exposition of Hebrews 1, show you how Hebrews, Hebrews 1 murders, decimates Jehovah's Witness theology and proves that Jehovah's Witnesses, their theology is from the pit of hell. Are you ready? Are you ready now for me to unpack this? Are we ready to begin? Because I have about, yeah, I have a good 40 minutes. Can you hang with me for 40 minutes? Because then I go live with David Wood, Lord willing. Okay. Hebrews 1, verse 4. Hebrews 1, verse 4. Hebrews 1, verse 4. <laughs> I like I like you. Bakumuzi Guala. Can you make your name a little harder for me to say? Bakumuzi Guala. If I have a son, I'm going to name him Bakumu Ziguala. Hebrews 1, 5. Where, Hebrews 1, verse 4, brother. Where is it? Hebrews 1, verse 4. I love you, man. My African brother who loved Jesus. Some of the greatest Christian martyrs and soldiers, theologians, were from Africa. Tertullian was from Africa. The Cappadocian fathers were from Africa. Augustine was from Africa, even though many Orthodox don't like him, so we'll keep him out of the picture. Hebrews 1, verse 4. Let's read. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance. Okay, my apologies. He just told me they're from Asia Minor. That tells you I suck at geography. Forgive me, Alan. I didn't mean to get you upset, so you get angry and stone me. Hebrews 1, verse 4. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Let's look at Hebrews 1 verse 4 one more time. Hebrews 1 verse 4. Well, Turkey is close to Africa, okay? So I went on a technicality, you big Turkey. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Did you catch it? This passage was misinterpreted by our very demonized Jehovah Witness friend, EEW, to show that Jesus was inferior in nature to angels and became superior to angels in nature. Okay? Let me explain how he was trying to distort it. Can I show you how they distort this passage? See, Jesus became better than the angels. Why? Because on earth he was a man. And as a man, he was inferior to them in essence. Then his nature changed because, guys, you need to listen to this. Because I know you know this. Some of you don't. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in a resurrection. They believe in a recreation. What do I mean? 
Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the man Jesus died and his body was deteriorated, was dissolved, and then Jehovah recreated the Archangel Michael with the memories of Jesus. So the man Jesus no longer exists. The Archangel Michael was recreated with the memories of Jesus. So whom the one they call Jesus is not the human Jesus. It's the Archangel Michael. So they believe Jesus went from a mere human creature who was inferior to angels in essence to then having the Archangel Michael recreated, brought back into existence with the memories of Jesus. And that Archangel Michael is who you call Jesus, even though in reality it's not the human Jesus because the earthly Jesus doesn't exist. And that Archangel Michael is superior to them in nature. That's what he was trying to preach yesterday. That's what that heretic was preaching yesterday. That's what EEW was trying to get you to believe. So to him, Hebrews 1.4 means Jesus, the human, was inferior in nature to angels. Then the archangel Michael, who was brought into existence, recreated with the memories of Jesus, is now superior to angels in nature. They were actually on acid, John Doe. Some of the Watchtower governing body members were on an acid trip with the Grateful Dead. Right? You with me there? That's what they believe. Now, what does it mean when it says Jesus became better than the angels? Hebrews 1 verse 4. Hebrews 1 verse 4. So that's why I said I got to now school this guy on this passage and we're going to be there. What does it mean that he became so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they? Does it mean that Jesus was inferior in nature to angels? God bless you, Michala, right? Or does it mean that Jesus was lower than them in position and status? Did he become better than them in status or better than them in nature? Okay, Hebrews 1, 4. Let's, let's let Hebrews explain. Are you ready now to embark on this journey of interpreting Hebrews correctly to silence these blasphemous swine and dog of the devil? Now, you see why I call them swine and dog? Okay, Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 9. Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 9. Love you too, Brian. God bless you. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. Now, guys, here's where I need you to really pay attention to the passages. Understand what you're reading. You got to understand what you're reading. It's talking about mankind, right? The world to come will be under the control of human beings, not angels. The world to come, not this world. The world to come will be subject to humans. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. So that world to come won't be controlled by angels. It will be controlled by humans. And he quotes the psalm to prove it. Hebrews 2, 6 to 8, which is a citation of Psalm 8, verses 4 to 6. Hebrews 2, 6 to 8, pay attention. This is where you're going to learn if you pay attention. But one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? In other words, why are you so concerned about man? Why do you think of man so much? Why is your concern and your affection placed on man? Why is the man the focus of your attention and your heart? Why, God? Why waste your time thinking about a maggot like man? Notice what it says. You have made him a little lower than the angels. That's the key. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now notice what it says. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing. Let me see that. Sorry. He left nothing that is not put under him. God has subjected everything under man. However, for a season, man is lower than the angels. 
Angels are higher in rank and glory than human beings. And we'll, I'll explain in a minute why. Okay, that was Hebrews 2, 5 to 8. And then now notice verse 9. Verse 9. Oh, I think Alzheimer's kicked in and he didn't put verse 9. Guys, you got to bear with Protestants. Sometimes Alzheimer's. Hebrews 2, 9. Okay, so now notice what it says. Notice what it says. Pay attention to the text. Okay. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. Now we don't see everything put under man. So what, what does that mean? Hebrews 2, 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Did you guys catch it? Here's what the author of Hebrews is saying. The world to come is subject to man. Which man? Glorified human beings. Redeemed human beings. Redeemed by Jesus. So the world to come, the world to come will be subject to us. We human beings, redeemed by Christ, will rule over the world to come. So now the author of Hebrews is saying, but when you look around you, you see the world has fallen. You see Christians are persecuted. You see pagans killing Christians, imprisoning Christians, feeding them to the lions. Christians are doing, doing anything but ruling over the world. And we know that these pagans, these rulers, these unbelievers are influenced and controlled by evil spirits, fallen angels that actually govern the earth. So what does it mean? God has subjected all things under man. We don't see things subject to us, the redeemed in Christ. We see the world under the control of evil angels and their human puppets and instruments. So what is Hebrews saying? And what's the proof that God has subjected all things to us? Jesus. Jesus. You understand what his argument is? If you doubt... That God has sworn to make the world your possession. If you doubt that the world is subject to you. And if you doubt that in the restoration of the heavens and the earth and the world to come, all will be yours. Keep your eyes on Jesus and doubt nothing. Because Jesus became man and assumed our status. He assumed the status of fallen human beings. And what is the status of fallen humanity? Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the glory they had that made them higher than angels was taken away, and now they've been made less than angels. You understand the argument now? You understand his argument? Because i got to unpack the argument before I move on. You see what he's saying here? Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the glory they had as the crown of creation, higher than angels, was taken away as part of their punishment, and they were made lower than the angels in position and glory, which is why angels are mightier than us and more glorious than us after the fall. Okay. I want it to sink in before I move on to the next point. So what did Jesus do? Why are we now lower than the angels? Because of sin. So part of the punishment of sin, we lose our glorious status, our glorious state. We become demoted from the status that God had confirmed, conferred on Adam and Eve. He made them the crown of his creation. Everything subject to him, even angels. But because of sin, we lost it. So because of sin, we are now lower than angels in status and position. So guess what Jesus did? He goes, I'm not just going to become man and enter your fallen world. I'm going to assume your status and for a season allow even the angels that I created to be higher than me in glory and status. Do you understand that? If this doesn't make you fall more in love with Jesus, fall more in love with the Godhead, with the Father, Son, and Spirit, I don't know what will. Jesus not only entered the world, he entered the fallen world, 
and took upon the consequences of the fall in that because of the fall, he allowed himself to become lower than the angels in status and glory and allowed himself to take a body that can decay and grow old and be beaten and put to death and die with the exception of sin. Before I move on. Before I move on. Did you catch it? That's why now let's look at Hebrews 2 verse 9. Now let's reread it again. Hebrews 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels. Why? So he could suffer death. And then be crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. You know what he's saying here? He did it to take your punishment. What was your punishment? You become lower than the angels and you die. So Jesus says, I will now take upon myself the consequences of your sin, which means I will take upon myself the punishment of your sins, a punishment I don't deserve, but I voluntarily take because of my love for you, so I can now pay your debt, undo the damages and the consequences of your sin, so now I can elevate you higher than the angels. Is it sinking in? Let's not go into Isaiah 9.6. It's got nothing to do with the talk. Focus on the talk. Right? Can you imagine the eternal creator of heaven and earth, the creator of the angels, allowed the angels to be higher than him in rank and glory? And the angels are seeing their creator, God, in the flesh, assuming a status lower than them so that they're glorious and luminescent, and yet his glory is veiled? You want me there? I want it to sink in. I don't want this just to be theology. Okay. I want it to be a th theology that penetrates your minds and your hearts so you know what God did and so you can fall in love with this God and worship him and love him. That's my, my goal. Okay. Okay. So follow with me. We're going to unpack this. Yep. He is infinitely humble. Right. So that's what he did. Now we understand Hebrews 1.4. Now let's tie in Hebrews 2.9 with Hebrews 1.4 again. Thank you, Joe. God bless you. Hebrews 2.9 with Hebrews 1.4 again. Michael Lawler. How did he die? He didn't have original sin. See, when you ask these questions, I know you're, you're being sincere. How did he die? He didn't have original sin. Because only someone who sins dies. So now, according to your logic, Jesus must have had original sin because he died. Right, Michael Lawler? How did Jesus die? He didn't have no sin. And if you don't sin, you don't die. So now explain that to me, Mike. Hope you don't mind me calling you Mike. Explain it to me. Let's use your logic here. He died, therefore he must have had original sin, according to your logic. So how do you answer that question, Mike? I want you to answer because it's easy to answer. Think about it. I just explained it, Mike. Jesus had no original sin, but he died. But only the soul that sins shall die, right? So why did he die? No, Algeria, you're not getting it. Don't answer this question. Alan, oh, go ahead and answer it. Jesus didn't have original sin. Why did he die? That's the whole message of salvation. I don't know why it's confusing to folks that they can't answer this. First and last answered it. Turb answered it. Sarah answered it. Verse, Veronica answered it. He died in our place to take our punishment. He doesn't have to have original sin to bear our punishment. But part of our punishment means he also assumes our lower status. I just explained that. Thank you, Andrew, who is a Christian at heart, though he professes to be an atheist. Did you get the answer now, Michael Lawler?
Jesus voluntarily died in our place to take the punishment you deserve upon himself so that you could be spared, forgiven, and live in the sight of God forever. Part of that punishment is dying physically, but also suffering the loss of the status of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve was given a status that made them higher than every creature. Sin, they lost that status. So part of the punishment upon mankind is we lose that glorious status that was ours because of God conferring a status upon mankind as the crown of his creation and image bearers reflecting him. Guys, don't get into side talks with Andrew. Guys, focus, please. Please, guys, focus. Learn your theology. Don't worry about Andrew. Let Jesus worry about him. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. He's even telling you pay attention. Come on, get your theology. Okay. Original sin means this: the first sin committed. What was the original sin? The first sin committed, the sin of Adam and Eve. It's talking about the first sin of mankind. What was the first sin committed, Zena? What was the original sin? The first sin? The sin of Adam and Eve. We're talking about mankind. Okay? So why was he lower than the angels? Because that's the punishment of our sin. Assuming a status lower than the angels. Why did he grow old and decay? Put it, in fact, here. Did God create Adam and Eve to die or to live immortally? So we're going to have another, we're going to have a part two on this. I got to do a part two. Did God create Adam and Eve to die or to live immortally? That means when they were created with those bodies, their bodies were designed in such a way to live forever. But if they chose to rebel, then sin would corrupt their bodies. Their bodies would grow old, decay and die. But Jesus is sinless. So why did his body grow old and start decaying and die? Because he took the consequence of our sins and the sin of Adam and Eve. So he didn't grow old because he sinned. His body didn't decay because he sinned. His body didn't die because he sinned. It's because you sinned, I sinned, Adam and Eve sinned. And he's bearing that punishment. See, people think that Jesus bore the punishment of our sin by simply dying on the cross. No. From conception to the grave, he was bearing the punishment and consequence of our sin. Because the effects of sin upon us isn't just that you die, that you grow old, you fatigue, you decay, and you die. Right? You understand? So why did Jesus' body get tired? Why did he hunger? Why did he eat to sleep? Why was it f decaying and getting older? Because that's the consequence of your sins that he took upon himself, though he's sinless. Are you guys understanding now? Is it sinking in, right? In other words, you keep focusing on the death on, on the cross as the consequence and punishment of sin. Our entire earthly life is a punishment for sin. What, how do you explain children born with birth defects, with diseases, or children in the womb having defects or diseases because of the consequence of sin? How do you explain children, infant? who do not know the difference between right or wrong, dying physically, consequence of sin. How do you expect? How do you explain, even now as we speak, and I need to remind, pray for our sister Magdalene. Pray the Lord Jesus bless her because she's having some physical discomfort, some physical issues. Pray God will give her perfect health, restoration, and heal her by the stripes of Jesus. How do you exp explain our aches and our pains, consequence of sin? Our entire earthly life is under the consequence of sin, the effects of sin, right, because of the fall. Sister, you want to share what your condition is so they can pray for you? Do pray for her. She's a mother of two beautiful daughters, and she needs the grace of Jesus to be healthy and to provide for them. So pray for her.
right? So when you're telling me, why did Jesus assume that lower status? Because he came to bear the consequences of our sin. He came to endure the punishment of our sin. Is it making sense to everybody now? Making sense, everybody now? Okay. So now, what happened after Jesus died and rose again? Hebrews 1, verses 3 to 4. Good, Christos and SD. Christos, as you seek the face of God, he'll answer you in his time. We just need to be patient. Uh, Peter, what about it? Was that a moral evil? The tsunami. Let me silence this dog who thinks he's intelligent right here. Was that a moral evil? Do you think that was evil for all those people to die? Let's get rid of this demon real quickly. The guy who think and he's and shame he's got a name of Peter. What an insult to Peter. Let me get rid of this guy real quick. It's a shame he's got such a blessed name. Are you asking as a sincere Christian? Or are you asking to attack? All right, sorry, I didn't know, because I thought it's an atheist objection. All right, wait till the end. I'll answer that question. It kills me when an atheist tells me, what about tsunamis, man? What about, what about them, dude? In the naturalistic worldview, things just happen. That's just nature. And we're bags of, you know, we're molecules in motion. We're nothing but bags of molecules, chemical reactions. So what if a chemical reaction gets swallowed by water? Where's the moral evil in that? Surprise, David. Anyway, let's focus. Hebrews 1, verse 4, and Hebrews 2, verse 9. Hebrews 1, verse 4, Hebrews 2, verse 9. Let's focus. Buddhist, Buddhist, brother, Buddhist. Hebrews 1, verse 4, Hebrews 2, 9. Now you understand what it means, having become so much better than the angels, as by inheritance obtain a more excellent name than they. But we see Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. You understand what it means he became better than the angels? Hebrews 2.9 explains Hebrews 1.4. God bless you, Bakumuzi. Man, can I call you Beck? You see, lower than the angels, he became better than the angels. Is it now making sense? Is it making sense how Jesus could become better than the angels? Right? Pray for funny Peter Tube's father. You guys catching it now? Hebrews 2 9, lower than the angels, and he tasted death. After resurrection, he becomes better than the angels because he goes from being lower than the angels in rank and position and glory to higher than the angels in rank and position and glory. Did everyone get that? If you don't get it, I can't move on. No, it has nothing to do with the new body. No, no, Zena. Has nothing to do with the new body. No, don't get yourself confused. No, it's nothing to do with the new body. It has to do with he ascended back to glory, not because he had a new body. It was while on earth, he was in a state of a servant, humbling himself to be lower than the angels. Now, after the resurrection, he was exalted to his glorious station, the station he had before he came down to the earth that made him higher than the angels. Sorry, Peter, I didn't know. I'll ask you a question a little later. Sorry, brother, I didn't know because you just came out of nowhere with Teutonic Place, and I don't know what you're talking about. Don't scare me like that, brother, because I don't know who you are. But just be patient. I'll get to you if I can. If not, I'll get to you soon. Why would he be higher than before algebra? How do you get any higher than having the status of Jehovah God? If Jesus was Jehovah God before he became flesh, there is no higher status than that. And if you're still Jehovah God after the resurrection, there is no status higher than that. So I don't know what you mean by higher. Higher what? He's always had the status that belongs to Jehovah God, but he set that status aside voluntarily when he came to the earth. So that status he had, it was his, but he set aside. But now there's an added element. There's an added element. You know what the added element is? Here's where it should really blow you guys, shock you, and really humble you that Jesus loves you this much. Peter, just be patient, brother. Let me just finish it. Let me get, finish this point. I can't go into Teutonic plates when I'm trying to finish this point. 
Okay. You understand the implication of Jesus becoming man and then being raised in the flesh, becoming a glorified man with a glorified body? You understand? Not only was he exalted to the status that he had before he humbled himself, but being man, he also exalt, exalted humanity to share in that status because Jesus is on the throne, not simply as God, but as the God-man. So because his human nature is attached to him, whether you like it or not, his human nature was also exalted. So now it's not just the God who's on the throne. It's the God-man. And as man's representative, he now elevated mankind to the status of God. You understand? That's what he did. He didn't return there just as God. He went there as the God man. That human nature that he took from his blessed mother while she was a virgin. He now glorified, immortalized, raised that physical body. Listen to yesterday's session. I went into that in depth. And in that glorified body as a man, he was exalted to the status of Jehovah. And now that status belongs to him as the God man. And being man, he's now elevated the status of humanity to share in Jehovah's status over all creation. You with me there? Ephesians 2, 6 for the proof. Ephesians 2, verse 6 for the proof. As your representative... As your eldest brother, being part of your family who loves you and is flesh and blood like you, when he was exalted, he was exalted as the God-man with his human nature intact and a physical body that he made deathless. So by being lifted up in the flesh as man who's also God, he lifted up the dignity and status of humanity with him, all human beings that believe in him and are united to him. Here it is, Ephesians 2, verse 6, if you don't believe me. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Talking to believers and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Right now on earth, I'm sitting with Jesus because I'm part of his spiritual body. I'm connected to him. Space doesn't separate me from him. He's my head, so he's, he's on the throne representing me, so I'm with him in spirit. That's Ephesians 2, verse 6. You read it right there. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Right? And then Revelation 3, verse 21. Revelation 3, verse 21. Revelation 3, 21. Dina and Zina. I like that. Dina and Zina. I think they're Assyrians. Dina and Zira. Zina. I got meaning. Revelation 3.21, read what Jesus says to those who overcome. Revelation 3.21, notice what Jesus says to those who overcome. To him who overcomes, Jesus speaking, and Jesus cannot lie. He's truth, can never lie, and he's almighty, he's alive, and he will do this. He will keep his promise to you who overcome. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Wow, saints. Jesus who's alive and cannot die, who is God, who is truth, and will keep all his promises to those who love him. Here's what he just said to all of us. You overcome, you will sit with me on my throne. Like I sit with my father on his throne. Did it sink in? Did it sink in? So you understand now the point of Hebrews 2? What is Hebrews 2 saying? What is he saying? Folks, you may not see the world subject to you believers, especially when you have unbelievers persecuting you, attacking you, imprisoning you, slandering you, and even trying to kill you. But rest assured, Jesus has overcome, and he sits at God's right hand, and his positioning with God the Father is a guarantee. You will rule the world to come 
and everything, even angels, will be subject to you. Never doubt it because Jesus is alive. Which is why Hebrews 1.14 says the following. Hebrews 1.14. Hebrews 1.14. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a part two, God willing. Me, brother? I hope so. You're going to make me cry. <clears throat> I hope they do. <clears throat> May Jesus have mercy on me. Hebrews 1.14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who inherit salvation? You see what he just said? Because of Jesus... And because you belong to Jesus, because you're born of the spirit of Jesus, because you're the spiritual body of Jesus, because Jesus is your spiritual head who nourishes you, who supplies all your needs, who loves you and seals you in his love and preserves you, angels now serve and minister to you. That's Hebrews 1.14. One more time. Thank you, sister. Hebrews 1.14. One more time. We're going to end it. We're going to do part two tomorrow. Guys, read this. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who inherit salvation? If you are destined to inherit salvation because you belong to Jesus, Michael serves you. Gabriel serves you. The angels serve you because you belong to Jesus. You understand? The angels see you, the redeemed of Christ, covered by his blood, sealed by his spirit, filled with his love, and they see Jesus in you. And they see that you're the spiritual body of their Lord, God, and creator. So they cannot help but serve you because serving you is serving their creator who is your spiritual head. Right there, Hebrews 1.14. You got it? I want it to sink in. I have no idea what you're talking about. Ortho don't believe it. What they don't they don't believe. It's in the Bible. Why wouldn't they believe this? Ortho don't believe that believers who are the spiritual body of Christ, Christ is the head, they're seated with Christ positionally. I'm not saying angels are not smarter than us, brighter than us, more glorious than us. It means though they are as mighty as they are, they are sent to serve you. I don't know if any Orthodox Catholic would disagree. Because after all, they invoke the intercession and the protection of angels. That means they agree that the angels are assigned to protect the people of God and to see for them. That's how important you are. Oh, oh no, we're not. It's, and it's not about inheriting Adam's sin. There's a difference, Zena. Let me explain. There's a difference between inheriting Adam's guilt, where you're condemned to hell for Adam's sin, and inheriting a sinful nature a sinful inclination that makes you prone to sin. I don't know of any Orthodox that denies it. What the Orthodox, from my understanding, deny is that I'm condemned because of Adam's sin to hell. What they affirm is you do have a sinful bent, a sinful inclination, and sinful nature. Otherwise, why do you sin? Now, I want the Orthodox to confirm if I'm right or I'm misunderstanding their position. I don't want to misunderstand their position. Right? So, Zina, so I guess you're Orthodox too. Okay. Okay, anyway. All right, so if that's clear, the Orthodox silent. Anna is silent too. Okay, good. Anna, when you're silent, you scare me. Okay, thank you, guys. I want to represent what my Orthodox brothers and sisters believe. And I do love you guys, man. I don't love you perfectly. I may get angry at you and lash out on you and beat you and, and you know, uh, attack you and, and insult you, but it's all because I love you. It's tough love, right? Where is the love? Now, you guys got it, right? What it means Jesus became better than the angels? It doesn't mean better in essence. It means superior to them in position and rank. Because as God in the flesh, he was always infinitely greater, better than them. Infinitely greater and better than them in essence. Now, he did take on a human nature... That was sinless, but in that humanity, he assumed the rank of fallen humans and became lesser than them in position. But then he dignified, glorified humanity in him. It's like the saying of the church fathers, right? It's that Jesus became man so that we can become God in the sense that he will then 
not make us almighty, all-knowing, uncreated, but he will glorify us so we can be like him, immortal, incorruptible, deathless. Jesus became man that man may, may become God. Isn't that the saying of the church fathers? Jesus became man that man may become God, right? He became a son of man that we can become sons of God, okay? Now, what did they mean and what they did not mean? Let me explain what they did not mean. They did not mean that we humans will be almighty, all-knowing, present everywhere, uncreated. That's not what they mean. They mean that like God is deathless, we will be deathless. Like God is absolutely pure and perfect and sinless, we will be pure, perfect, and sinless. We'll be morally incorruptible and physically immortal, and death will no longer have power over us because of the grace of the triune God. I hope I represented the Orthodox faith correctly. Opa! Hey! Opa! Tikaris, que si Opa! All right. Okay. Let me end it with this. Lord willing, part two. Now, before I go with this other passage, I just want to make clear. You want me to flex? Here you go. No matter what you do. I, I haven't hit weights, so that's why there's no tone. But I can still do this. Be careful. Don't pass out. All right. Before I go to the last passage and get prepared for the live stream. Before I go to the last passage and prepare for the live stream. Because right after this, I'm going with David Wood. He'll speak 90% of the time, so he'll give me rest. Okay. Here it is. Okay, Magdalene, no jiggle. Here it is. When it says Jesus became better than the angels, did you get the answer now? Acts 17, apologetics, 40 minutes from now, angel, and I'm going to go live with David Wood, Acts 17, apologetics. You understand what it means? He became better than the angels. It means not better in nature because as God, he's always infinitely better than them and greater than them. It means by becoming human, he assumed the fallen status and position of human beings, so he became less than the angels in rank and glory, Hebrews 2.9. But then when he died and rose again, he then elevated himself in union with the Father and the Spirit to the status he had before he humbled himself, the status that belongs to God because he is God by nature, so he became better than them in rank and position. But because he's now human... That humanity that he attached to himself, that's united to him, he then glorified, dignified humanity and raised humanity higher than the angels in position and glory. That's what God did in Jesus Christ our Lord because of his love for us. Yeah, but Philo will put me in a pickle. So with that said, let me end it with a passage that I pray, Holy Spirit, you will move them, move me. To fall so in love with you and the Father and the Son and be in awe of you and live for you and die for you in Jesus' name. Let me end it with this passage. Let me really bless you and blow you away how much the triune God loves you and why you have to love him more and more. Be zealous for his glory if it means fighting for his glory, if it means getting killed for his glory, if it means having to insult people who blaspheme him and put them in their place. Do it because he's worthy. Because let me show you this, and we're going to end it. John 17, 23 to 24. Guys, read this. Holy Spirit, etch these words in their hearts and in my heart and in my daughter's heart and even in their mother's heart for the glory of Jesus. John 17, 23 to 24. Guys, I hope this moves you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Watch here. John 17, 23 to 24. Watch here. Guys, read. Please read with me. Take a moment not to type, but read and meditate. Meditate. Jesus praying to the Father, I am in them, Father, and you in me, that they may be, may be made perfect in one, that the world may know, the world will realize, watch, watch this, that you have sent me, they believe that you, Father, sent me, and you have loved them as you have loved me. Right there, that should move you in your heart by the power of the Spirit. Jesus says, because I live in you by my spirit, because I'm in union with you and you belong to me and you're my spiritual body, born of my spirit, my father loves you just as much as he loves me, no more, no less. 
as much as my father loves me, that is as much as he loves every one of you. He loves you just as much because you are in me and my spiritual body. My father adores you. He's in love with you just as much as he adores me and is in love with me. Why? Because you are mine. You are one with me in the spirit. You are my spiritual body. And so now notice what Jesus asks for us. Verse 24. Father, I did, man, this is going to make me cry. <clears throat> Father, I desire. And the Father gives Jesus every single desire of his heart. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me. May be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. <clears throat> For you love me before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> you understand what he just said? <clears throat> Bobby. Ya Bobby. Ya Khubbi. My father, my beloved. This is the desire that I want you to grant me. All your children that I've purchased by my blood, born of our spirit, that are one with me, my spiritual body. Ya yeah, Babi. My father. Bring them to me where I am. Not beneath me, underneath my feet. Alongside of me. So they can see the glory you've lavished on me. So they can see how much you love me and that you've been in love with me before the world was created as I'm in love with you. And that love you have for me, you love them to the same degree and to the same depth. That's what I desire <laughs> for my church. That's what I desire for my church. That's Jesus. No wonder... They call him the Savior. We love you, Bobby. We love you. I fail you and have mercy on me. Please don't let me fail you anymore and shame you. Please. And purify my heart to be sincere towards you. Son of God. Blessed Son of the Virgin. Son of David. Our God and Savior. Lord Jesus. We love you. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on my daughters, Lord. Love them and bring them to me and save me from these calamities. Lord Jesus, for their sake. Holy Spirit of the living God, the eternal Spirit of the Father, the eternal Spirit of the Son, we love you and we worship you and we depend on you. Save us from ourselves, our sinfulness, from Satan and his children and from this world. And keep us in love with Jesus. We thank you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, and Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord willing, in about 50 minutes, I go live with David Wynn and Acts 17 Apologetics. And God willing, part two, part two of this, tomorrow, God willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please pray for my miracle, miraculous deliverance, so I can be free to be with my daughters and serve Jesus for the holiness to delight him and the health I need. And the provision to take care of myself and my daughters. I love you guys. Orthodox, I love you. Roman Catholics, I love you. Coptics, I love you. Assyrian Church of the East, the church of my parents and my ancestors, I love you. And my Protestant brothers and sisters, I love you. You're my brothers and sisters in Jesus. But remember, I can't do much. And Andrew, I love you because you're a Christian at heart. And even if you weren't, I'd still love you and pray for you to be a Christian. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.